Good evening. Welcome to our interview tonight with Brian Lay. He's a candidate for House Rep District 4. Uh, before we get to the interview, a little information on Huli Pack. Huli Pack was birthed from a shared drive to rework our system by seeking Aina based equity focused leadership for our Hawaii Island community. Now more than ever, we need leaders who are willing to circle back to our roots and instill real change in our community from Kona to Ka'u to Hilo Kahabi. The time is now to huli our system. Conducting our interview tonight is Antu Harvey. Uh, before we get to the interview, Brian, uh, why don't you take a few moments to introduce yourself? Aloha, like we said, Brian Lay running for state representative district four, uh, born in Oahu, living in uh, the big island Puna district right now. And before we get started, I just wanted to say, you know, I, I know these questions, you know, these are my personal opinions and everything. And, you know, as a legislator, I think I should, you know, what the people say, what I, I don't care what, what my opinion is, but, you know, if I get an overwhelming response from the people in my district that they want something, that's the way I'm gonna vote. And I think that's the way it should be. And that's the problem we get right now is we've got a lot of party politics going on where people are voting for the party instead of for the people. And that was one of the big reasons I decided to run was because I got tired of party politics and we just need to do what's right for the island and what's right for the people. So thank you for having me on here. And uh, I hope we have a good time. Thank you, Brian. Uh, on to. Brian, aloha. So what inspired you to run for office at this time? And please uh, describe your core values. Uh, like I said, I got tired of being ignored by my state legislators for three years running, not one return phone call. And, you know, I work closely with GMAC, Game, Manage Game Management Advisory Council. And, you know, it was just, I'm just tired of being ignored and it, the politicians doing what they want instead of what the people wanted. And, you know, like I was growing up, you need to quit crying about it and do something. So I threw the papers in and decided to run. Okay, thank you. Um, how have you advocated for your community and what community projects have you worked on? Uh, like I said, I'm vice chair for the county GMAC. You know, we've been pushing a lot of uh, environmental issues, hunting issues, Hawaiian gathering and rights. And, you know, I've been working with the community. I trap a lot of pigs and, you know, keep the neighborhoods, trying to keep the pigs under control you know, giving feed out and doing free food giveaways at the Eagles and the Leilani estates. You know, when I get too much pig and everybody's fear, freezers are full, I'll cook up a bunch of food and, and put the word out and, and bring it in. So just kind of working with the community and stuff like that on, on issues like that, the environment, and Mauna Kea, the eradication on the sheep and other handling issues and environmental issues that we work with. Thank you. Um, talking about kind of political progress, um, resolving some issues require both state legislature and county council actions. What specifically would you do to try to make these siloed governing bodies more effective regarding coordination, cooperation, and partnering? Yeah, like I said, it's all back to party politics. You know, everyone needs to set party politics aside and work together and do what's right. You know, I've uh, Nonpartisan, you know, I've been to the Honolulu pushing our bills with GMAC and working closely with both Democratic and Republican lawmakers to get bills right. You know, if you sit down and talk to the people, a lot of times, you know, it's just just need to talk to them and, and, and they see things right most of the time. I mean, there's a few that just blatantly disregard the science and what opinion and everything and, and vote party, part, party lines. But for the most part, a lot of people work together if you put the effort in and, and act like a decent human being and treat everybody with respect. I think we can get a lot farther along here. Thank you. Um, what are the critical issues that have arisen in your district um, that you'll represent that could be addressed by the state legislature? Well, the big problem right now in the Pune district is the out of control pigs. I know either with GMAC or myself being elected, we've got a whole list of uh, bills that we're going to try to introduce to help keep the pig population under control. 
also the goat population. We've been talking to the legislators on the Kona side and the homeowners and the landowners on trying to get things resolved to keep the, uh, you know, we need good game management and we need to work on that. And another issue is, is we've got a hot, bad crime problem going on in Puna and we need to work on that and not be doing bail free bonds. We need to start holding the judges responsible for the people, you know, maybe some mandatory sentencing for, you know, we've got people that are just career criminals that are doing the majority of the crime and they're out on the street within 12 hours. We need to do something about that. The infrastructure in Puna is, is horrible. You know, the, the building permit process is going through the roof, but our infrastructure is way behind. And by the time we do the infrastructure we got, we're, we're going to be in the same position. We need to be thinking ahead. And, you know, when we get so many building permits going, we should have the infrastructure to handle those permits by the time the houses are built instead of waiting before we have a problem. I think we really need to be proactive on infrastructure and crime and other issues like that. Thank you. Thank you. I'll do a follow up question on that one. Um, a lot of the infrastructure is kind of in the purview of the mayor and county council. Um, so as a legislature, le legislator, how would you, you know, where do you see the legislature fitting in and partnering on infrastructure in your district? Yeah, work closely with where the county, county rep is and also the, you know, we've got the state and also federal grants for, for infrastructure and roads and stuff like that, that I know we could tap into the federal funds and also state funds and you know find solutions and, and look for the money and maybe not spend money on other things and, and put it towards infrastructure instead of some other pet projects that just please the party thank you what three priority issue proposals or bills were before the last legislative session that you adamantly either opposed or supported well I, Supported 18, HB 1872, which was a GMAC bill, which was a food sustainability, treating our game animals as a, as a valuable resource for uh, oh, food sustainability. And these animals need to be treated with, with respect and, and humane treatment, which they aren't getting with the DLNR, is, was one of our big priorities. And also we did a lot of uh, pro-gun legislation with the Second Amendment group on Oahu. We work closely with them, getting some bills passed. We've got the shooting range uh, passed through uh, for the Big Island. The Big Island has no public shooting range. We've just got some scraped dirt, mile marker 16. You know, we've got the legislation passed. Hopefully the mayor, governor signs it where we can get a, some legitimate real shooting ranges where people have a safe place to practice using their firearms and everything, especially after today with the uh, su Supreme Court ruling on the concealed weapons. You know, we need a place where people can practice and feel comfortable. We don't need a bunch of yahoos running around not knowing what they're doing because there's no place for them to learn or, or do anything like that. Thank you. So I'm gonna pivot and um, kind of touch on Native Hawaiian rights. How best do you think um, a path can be forged towards restoration of occupied lands? Well, I think the should two part to open up the uh, housing crisis. I think they need to be giving out the land and I don't want to sound racist or anything, tribal things where the Hawaiian homelands, they can set up their own thing as far as setting up what, you know, if they want to put sub, not to code housing up, just just so people can put on and get on there and, and not be paying these ridiculous rents that we're paying so people can get ahead and everything and let the, the little communities take care of themselves and police themselves and decide what they think is best for themselves, I think would be a, a major step in that direction. Okay, thank you. Land use and development. Uh, what are your top three priorities for allocation of infrastructure funding? Well, being in Puna, I think roads would be the number one infrastructure. Puna only has basically one way out. We need several different things. If there is another natural disaster or something to happen in Puna, there's no way that we're gonna get everybody out. 
we need uh, we need alternate accesses. So several years ago, we had somebody hit and killed in front of the KL dump, and the whole basically Puna was gridlocked. Somebody said, you know, it took them over four hours to go the alternate route to get into Hilo. You know, if something happens, you know, major car accident or something like that, we need to open up the roads and access. And like I said, living on top of an active volcano, we need to be able to get these people out in a hurry if we need to. I think roads and accesses would be the top priority. Okay, so that so would be, that. thank you. That would be a really important one. Um, are there two other areas of infrastructure that are important to you? Not off the top of my head. I mean, okay. the, okay. Well, the roads are, have been a big issue for years. As long as I've lived in Pune for 15 to 18 years, it's, the roads here have always been an issue. Okay. Thank you. Um, diversified and circular economy. Um, tourism will continue on our shores regardless. How would you ensure that the tourism industry is of service to our working families rather than the other way around? And especially for Pune, very often workers are commuting long distances for work. Well, I think one, one thing that really hurt the Pune district was the uh, Airbnb closure because a lot of a lot of small businesses and stuff were depending on the Airbnb businesses around here because there was no reason to drive into Hilo when you can drive to Pahoa and hit the mom and pop stores and the restaurants and other oh, industries that are based on the Airbnb, you know, the cleaning services, lawn care and, and all those other things. Okay, thank you. So food, food security and agriculture, what is your definition of food security sovereignty for Hawaii and what and how would you implement programs to fulfill your statement if elected? Well, I think we should be cutting our farmers, a big tax break, giving good incentives. You know, Hawaii is rated the worst place to have a business or run a business. We need to change that, get rid of the regulations. The big island, we only have one, uh, slaughterhouse facility and it only does cattle you know we've got all these small farms and ranches that are sheep goats and pigs that have no access we need to open up cottage industry and uh oh some states have it you know but you don't have to go through the usda and all the other certified kitchens if you're selling to the ultimate consumer like the amish communities do in the back east you know if we pass some laws where you know Mom and pops can do their own butchering and selling to the the consumer on a trust basis, I think, which would help greatly on food sustainability. And also boosting the cottage industries and stuff where we, people can lift themselves up. There, there's plenty of small businesses and, and farms here that would use a good boost if we could get the government's regulations off them and let them let them flourish. Thank you. Um, climate change. Um, so regarding sea level rise and adaptation, counties have discretion to regulate their setbacks and hardening shorelines. So there's coordination with the state uh, and anticipate regulated management shoreline retreat. What other preparations should be, what do you feel about that? And what other preparations should we be making for sea level rise now? Yeah, I think we should have been setting setbacks a while ago just for storm reasons and everything else. Also access for the people, the fishermen and everybody else. I think that building houses right to the beach line is is wrong personally. And, you know, I think Hawaii being an island and everything, I think we should be looking into wave technology. There's a lot of new technology coming out with wave thing, get away from the, the solar panels and the windmills. And you know the wave is 24/7. I think would be highly benefit the island since we are an island. We should be looking into wave technology to reduce our uh, carbon footprint. Thank you. I have a uh, follow-up question to that, if you don't mind. Um, the the uh, governor has a bill on his desk right now. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Senate Bill 2510. It's uh, called the Firm Energy Bill, and it favors firm energy. Uh, sets strict limits on wind and solar in favor of firm energy, which actually means burning um, wood and, and trash. 
Um, what's your feeling on Senate Bill 2510? Yeah, you know, I, I against it. Anytime the government sets regulations on on what we can and can't do and what percentage of anything, I think we need to look on it, what the science is and, and what works best. Because some areas will would benefit. I know in in Puna, with the rod and all the trees and the albizia trees, you know we have plenty of uh, wood that would would supplement a bio bio burn but you know on the Kona side they don't have that so like I say you know we need to look at everything in a smaller area and instead of just making blanket statements that we're going to do x amount of this and x amount of that that's just uh pushing us in a shoehorn I think we should be able to expand wherever wherever it seems to be working the best and, and follow that route thank you thank you So um, I apologize. This one, I didn't I flag something. Um, what measures would you propose to increase the quality of our public schools and especially with the facilities? I know around the Big Island and in, in, in your district, um, our school facilities are, are um, like deferred maintenance. So how do you see the, as a legislator that you'd be able to potentially help with that problem? Uh, we need to do something, like I said, you know, Hawaii's education is just, just dismal and being, I'm tired of seeing Hawaii rank so low in so many things. I think we need to seriously look at what we need to do to bring the education of the kids back, whatever it takes, either computers, broadband, to access for everybody, more teachers, you know, we, we need to seriously look on, on why we're rating so low and do something about that. Yeah. So I'm going to pivot again, kind of marine management and conservation. Um, what will you do as a representative to empower and support local NGOs to accomplish their marine conservation missions? We have a number operating around our island. Yeah. Well, you know, that's that's a tricky thing. I mean, the native Hawaiians aren't, a lot of them aren't happy with, with closures and everything else like that. I think we should, uh, you know, we need to protect our resources, bottom line. And I think we need to do some, like I said, once the thing, the government just mandated, you know, the 30, 30, 30, you know, we need to, we need to be just more specific and, you know, target good areas, nursing areas, you know, like the, the one bay where we closed down during the coral spawning season, you know, and the rest of the year it's open. We need to, you know, look at things like that instead of just painting everything with a broad brush. I think we need to look into the science and, and do more science and base everything on science instead of ideology on what we think should be happening instead of doing what needs to be happening. Another follow-up to that is, um, from time to time, there's been a uh, an aquarium fishing ban bill that's uh, they've tried to put through uh, legislation that would ban the taking of fish uh, for uh, for aquariums. Uh, what's your position on that? You know, I've I've read the science on both sides, and both sides are have an opposing view. So, like I said, you know, when we when we can't have the science agree, how do we make an, an intelligent decision on what we need to do? I've talked to some other people and, you know, maybe we could work out some of the, the aquarium fisheries because I know we have problems with invasive species. Maybe they can target invasive species on like a uh, bonus program. You catch so many uh, roy and, you know, you're allowed, you know, you catch 500 roy, you're allowed to catch 20 tang or something like that, you know, where we can be benefiting everybody, you know, helping get rid of invasive species and also, you know, managing, supporting, if, if the science backs it up, that the populations are self-sufficient and we can do that. Like I said, you know, we need good scientific data instead of just ideology that we're getting a lot of in places these days. Thank you. On to? Um, to power infrastructure. Um, Several of the current electric vehicle charging stations around the island have been found to be inoperative for long periods of time. How would you work to help develop adequate network to keep pace with the demand for more chargers 
um, as a means to ensure that they stay maintained and safely accessible. Uh, wouldn't that be a county issue? I don't know. I thought that I would be know. state, I mean, state on county, and county. On county thing that the county, I mean, aren't the charging stations responsible? Whoever is putting the charging stations up, like a business or the county buildings or or state buildings, wouldn't that be the? They have. There are some bills that have been introduced that would um, support more charging stations on a state level. So. Okay. Well, like I said, you know, I, I, I've got a nuclear background. So, you know, the big thing is the 24 seven baseline, you know, we can throw all these charging stations in, but if we don't have the infrastructure to support the, the, the amount of power that's being driven on these things, you know, we need to look at that. Like I said, once again, we need to look at the science and plan accordingly. If we have the power grid to supply all these things, I mean, it's no good building 500 charging stations if we don't have a grid that'll support 500 charging systems being used. What is your position on, on uh, microgrids? Uh, in other words, decentralizing the um, electric, the distribution of electricity uh, throughout I, the state? I have no idea on, on microgrid. I haven't done any research on that, so I'm not gonna spout off some ignorant reply. Um, another another big issue is um, wastewater. Um, when we, you know, it's kind of circling back to um, infrastructure, and uh, the neighbor islands in particular have a a huge problem uh, regarding uh, wastewater treatment. How would you address that specific issue? Uh, like I said, you know, we need to do the science and find out where we're, where we're falling at. If we need more facilities, more high tech. Uh, programs to uh, clean the water up before we release it. I know in, in some places, I don't know with the lava, I know in California with the sand, you know, they, they could go with a higher gray water because the sand cleaned the water a lot better. Like I said, I don't know with, with Hawaii with how the, the lava percolates, but like I said, we need to do the science. And, you know, if we need new uh, water treatment centers, we need to get new water treatment centers or if we just need to upgrade the ones we have with some new technology and filtration systems to get the bad bacteria out. Because like I said, you know, it's, it's horrible that Hilo, every time we get bad storms, we get all this raw sewage running in and nobody does anything to the state, but we closed down a dairy that we needed because the, you know, it was a design flaw with the overflow of cattle poop going in. We closed that down but you know, Hilo is able to pollute the bay all the time. Every time we get large storms, you know, we need to address these issues and keep the water clean. Okay. Um, okay, I have a kind of a follow-on question to that. And some of this is my not knowing because I'm over on Kona side. Does Puna have any sewer systems or is everybody on um, cesspools or uh, what is it, individual sewage? Treatment. Cesspools or septic tanks. Most, septic tanks. Most of the Pune area is on cesspool. I know that they passed the new regulations. All the new houses now have to be on septic. Okay. Thank and you. I know that was an issue with a lot of the houses being close to the beach that they were getting a lot of bad water from the cesspools being that close to the ocean, which is something that needs to be resolved. Okay. And another one is, um, I think, is Pune mostly on catchment as far as potable water? The majority of Pune is, is on catchment. There are some some uh, county water issues, but the vast majority of it is catchment water. Okay. And are there any issues with that that you'd be able to help as a legislator to be able to help? Because the county's having difficulty finding the funding for all our infrastructure needs. Well, I mean, there's the feds have all sorts of grant programs. It's just amazing. I had a friend look into that and she said they, the federal government have grants for everything. We just need to get people to, to find the proper grant and apply for it and, and see where we go from there. I mean, there's money out there. We just need to find it. Do you see is the problem um, being that um, we're not applying in Hawaii, that we're not applying for, for grants? Um, or are there other hurdles or barriers for us from getting them? 
I think there's there's other hurdles and barriers. Like I said, you know, we we Hawaii is notoriously known for the corruption and party politics, and it's like I've stated, you know, it's it's just it's time for a change. We need to stop with the politics and do what's right. Okay, what, thank you. what would your solution be in regard to corruption? Um, what would oh, you I think a more a more stringent uh, background check. I mean, when we elect people with criminal past and then we act surprised when they do criminal activities, you know, I, I, I've stated, you know, if you if you can't get a gun in Hawaii, you probably shouldn't be in government office. You know what I'm saying? And we need to we've got laws. We need to start enforcing them. Like I said, you know, the FBI had to arrest the prosecutor in Honolulu because, you know, they weren't doing anything. You know, this is the problem. We've got, you know, rampant. We had the two uh, legislators got caught getting envelopes full of cash and they just got lost their job. You know, we need to start prosecuting these people, you know, and, and set an example. You know, the legislators should be held to a higher standard. You know, we're supposed to be leaders and setting the example for everybody. In my opinion, you know, this is this is my opinion. Like I said, I've got a nuclear background. I background checks, FBI checks, psych evaluations, and everything else, just to go work inside of a nuclear power plant. You know, I don't see why our legislators get a free pass when they're running running the our state and local government. Um, you had mentioned uh, uh, earlier. We discussed a little bit about the uh, Supreme Court ruling on uh, carrying concealed weapons, which could very well affect uh, some of the current laws here in the state of Hawaii, um, making them roll back some of the strict regulations that they have um, regarding carrying concealed weapons. How would you address that? Um, would you require um, more background checks and more um, you know, light licensing and that sort of thing? What would you do to address that issue if concealed weapons were suddenly allowed to be carried in Hawaii. Well, supposedly they're already allowed to be carried. I haven't looked into it a little bit. Like I said, you know, I'm just getting information. The little bit of information I got was that the Supreme Court said, you know, if you if you could legally buy a gun in your state, you can legally conceal carry. And like I said, Hawaii has one of the more stringent background checks and everything else. Like I said, I just renewed my long gun. And like I said, you know, I'm a nuclear employee. I'm checked by the FBI. And, you know, it took over two weeks for him to do a background check so I could get a piece of paper to say I could buy a long gun. You know, and pistols are, are so much horrendously worse as far as every pistol you got. I mean, there are so many roadblocks set up right now. I've already made two trips to the police department, you know, for a working individual to, to get the time to do that. And like I said, you know, I'm all for, safety like i said that's why we've been pushing for a shooting range we need places and classes and teach people how to properly use a firearm so we don't have like the uh, actor who just picks up a gun and points it at somebody and pulls the trigger you know anybody that's been through any nra class or any hunter safety thing knows you never point a gun at anybody regardless if you think it's loaded or not and we need to you know, maybe we need to open the schools up and start teaching hunter safety, not hunter safety, but gun safety and what to do if you run across a gun. Like I said, you know, I'm so old, you know, I took hunter safety course in sixth grade and, you know, I grew up with guns. I, I don't see anything scary about it. My dad was a Marine and a LAPD. So, you know, I've been around guns all my life. I don't see, you know, how people get all upset. Like, but I said, you know, I grew up with guns and I know better than to do a lot of these things. And I think we need to start teaching these kids like the same thing about teaching about drugs and alcohol and other harmful things. You know, you find a gun, you get an adult, you don't point it and play cowboy and Indians. Thank you. On to? Great, thank you. Um, so what solutions, um, kind of pivoting to those social issues uh, that are all kind of tied in together. Um, what solutions would you propose to combat drug addiction crisis, particularly methamphetamine epidemic? Yeah, well, like I stated in my uh, thing, I would like to legalize marijuana 100%, decriminalize it, and use the tax money from that, a portion of that, to go to rehab centers and also have the, the judicial system, you know, these nonviolent drug related offenses 
you know, twofold, we, we put them in a rehab center, either an inpatient or an outpatient, depending on the severity of their addiction and the crimes, you know, twofold, one, we get them off the streets for a little while, regardless if they get clean or sober, and it's going to save the state a lot more money putting them in a rehab than it would be putting them in a county lockdown where they're not going to learn anything. And, you know, hopefully somebody, some of these people might be able to turn their life around. I know a lot of people, you know, that had, you know, sketchy younger 18, 19 year olds, but, you know, now they're 40 years old, got a good county job, raising family and pillars of the community. You know, some, a lot of people can turn it around. You know, myself, I've got over 30 years sober, you know, and I don't do alcohol, but or marijuana, but I think it should be legalized for the people who want to do it. I know there's a lot of benefits. And like I said, you know, we need to get the government off there and then open it up to a free market and, you know, get the tax basis and use that money for rehabs for the harder drugs and alcohol that we're seeing a lot of the problems that are related to that. Thank you. You know, another social issue that's uh, affecting really not, not only uh, Hawaii Island, but the entire state is um, homelessness. And um, I'm just wondering how you feel that problem should be addressed. You know, you'll never get rid of homelessness. You know, there's some people that just, they like the lifestyle and everything. And I think we should, you know, open it up with the, with the resources that we need to, that these, if the people wanna get off, we have the resources for people to help them get off. And like I said, you know, the biggest problem is the drug and alcohol addiction. And, you know, if we can, you know, get them clean and sober and get them back on the right path, I think that would help alleviate the homeless problem. And, you know, I, a lot of them have drug addiction and there's a lot of uh, mental illness going on with a lot of the higher population of the, the homeless. And like I said, you know, maybe we, we county have some empty buildings and empty lots. Maybe we could set up some temporary housing you know, no stipulations, you know, some of these places, you know, you got to be clean and sober, you know, they don't go there. If we can just open it up and just let these have these places go where we have social workers, you know, that can keep tabs on these people and see if they're getting better, or, you know, if they're getting worse and becoming a threat to society. Like I said, you know, we've got red, red flag laws for gun owners, but, you know, we've got these psychotic people running around and we just, don't do anything and we let them run around until they stab somebody. You know, we need to look at that also. Well, that, that's a whole nother issue is uh, mental health. And it seems like uh, the state is woefully inadequate in addressing a lot of the mental health issues that abound. Uh, how would you address those issues? You know, you know, that's another one of the tough ones on personal freedoms and everything. I know in Leilani, we have an individual that is, uh, you know, has issues, he's been run over, lost a leg. He's, you know, in the middle of the street, he throws rocks, he's violent, you know, it's just, but, you know, he doesn't want any help. We sent social workers and everything else and there's nothing they say they can do. He just, you know, he's running rampant. And, you know, I'd hate to say that, you know, the state, you know, like the red flag laws, you know, on some of these things, if they're deemed a danger to society or to themselves, Maybe we need to relook the issue on uh, short-term care and health and seeing if we can turn it around and see if it is a drug and alcohol problem or if it is, really is a mental health issue. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Yeah, and then um, just on this, because this is just such, such important issues and um, they're somewhat interrelated with um, as collateral dance, um, harm being done. The foster system is currently overwhelmed and 25% of the youth end up homeless within two years of exiting the foster system. Um, this often feeds other social issues, drug abuse, sex trafficking. What can you, what do you suggest on that particular? Well, I mean, I think we maybe need to set up some like, uh, like we do with uh, drug and alcohol people need to set up some halfway houses, you know, instead of, you know, when they turn 18, kicking them out the door and, and cutting off supplies, when they turn 18, that we have these halfway houses that they, they can go to, bunk up, learn a trade, and, you know, we they've got the support they need instead of just turning them loose where they fall prey to, like you said, sex trafficking, drug and alcohol, because their future looks so bleak, you know, we need to, you know, we need to give them something to look forward to. 
or, you know, the hope in the thing instead of just, you know, turning them loose under the bridge and creating a problem. You know, maybe we could set up some, some halfway houses where these people having issues, maybe even with the homeless people, where the people can check in until they get over their crisis and get back. I know we've got problems with, with veterans. You know, I know that was one of the problems I was looking into was, uh, you know, Hawaii, you can't let anybody hold your gun for more than two weeks and the gun dealers won't hold them. So, you know, we need to change the rules. You know, if somebody's going through a crisis thing, says, you know, hold my guns for a while. I'm going through a bad stretch. We should be allowed that. And, you know, people shouldn't be scared to say that they're having trouble and they're having bad thoughts. And that's the problem that we've got is, you know, if somebody says I'm having issues and I'm worried, you know, there's so many repercussions that a lot of people aren't seeking out help because of these issues. You know, I think we need to look at quitting punishing people and giving them alternative without any consequences for doing the right thing and seeking help and not being stigmatized and, you know. Thank you. Any other questions on to? Well, I think I, I would like to do at least one more kind of circling back around to the food and agriculture. We didn't really touch on um, the invasive species and that's sure affecting our farmers, um, especially, but um, do you have any thoughts about um, the invasive species problem that the state isn't doing as much as they any, really should uh, be? Any species in specific are you talking about? Well, or you just, know, coffee, I mean, it's coffee such a leaves. broad area. Okay, coffee leaf rust, uh, little fire ants, uh, coffee berry borer, avocado lace bug, um, uh, the uh, rhinoceros beetles, you know, it's just the waves that we have several a year that are finding their way to our shores. Um, yeah, I, you know. A skunk. <laughs> yeah, I saw that today. It's not the first one they found either. Okay. But, I, you know, that's, you know, it's like the old saying, what comes to Hawaii stays in Hawaii. And I don't know how we could address the problem with, you know, the biggest thing would be if we were self-sufficient and we're not bringing in all this foreign food, you know, it would probably help cut back on these invasive species coming in because we're importing all of our food. And that's where all these, especially the insects are coming in, is that. So, like I said, you know, if we get twofold, if we can get our food sustainability up where we're not depending on foreign food so much. That should help. And like I said, I know the USDA is, is overwhelmed at the ports. We definitely don't have enough people inspecting the, the stuff that is coming in. Like I say, you know, we've, I've already found two of the uh, New Zealand longhorns in my house and I've got problems with, you know, like I said, why does it always affect our fruit trees and, and our food? You know, that's, that's the horrible thing. The fire ants are a pain in the butt but at least it's not affecting my avocado crop and tangerines and my citruses. Um, so like I said, you know, it's another, another thing we just need to sit down and do a serious look at and, you know, scratch around and find the money and do some, some intelligent thinking and, and try to get it at the bottleneck where it's going to do, where the dollar is going to do the most good. Yeah, you're so right. I mean, food sovereignty is, uh, a huge issue with a huge amount of our food being imported. It also drives food prices much higher. Um, what would you do to help local farmers uh, in terms of production, producing more food and getting that food out into the community? Like I said, you know, we need to just back off on the government regulations, give them tax breaks. You know, these are people that are feeding us and, and keeping us if we, you know, God forbid something ever happens and the ships don't come. We need these local farmers and these local ranchers, and we just need to, you know, give them every break we can to uh, thrive and, and succeed. You know, we need to talk to them and find out what their problem is. I, you know, every, every industry has their issues, and we need to talk to every industry and find out what their issue is. I know land availability, the price of land is getting ridiculous. You know, that's a major influence on why we have problems. And, you know, we need to utilize our game animals too. I mean, one of my things I would like to do would be, uh, like I said, start harvesting the wild animals and make it a market. Texas, you know, it's, it's a specialty market. They're getting $15 a pound for wild pork. 
Europeans just gobble that up. We've got access deer coming out of our ear on other islands and goats and sheep. You know, we need to utilize this and, and set up economies based on it to keep the populations under control, create a market for, uh, for people and, and self-sustainability. I have uh, um, one last question, and that's regarding the, uh, the governor just recently signed the uh, minimum wage bill, getting the minimum wage up to, uh, I believe, $18 an hour, and I don't know if it's 2026 or 2028. Um, my question, a lot of small business owners have complained that, that, that it's going to put them out of business. Um, do you feel that the minimum wage was set too high? You, and then following up with that, how would you help the small business owners um, in dealing with that? And to help the small business owners, once again, is Hawaii is rated the worst state to have a business in. We need to rec rectify that and get the stipulations out. I used to be a general contractor on the island. I know firsthand what a nightmare it is to do business. I spent more time doing paperwork, paying all these bills and taxes and everything quarterly that I had no time to expand my business. You know, and 08 finally put me out. And, you know, I've, I've got mixed feelings, you know, prices of everything is going up. We need to, uh, you know, a lot of you, people can't survive on minimum wage, even with food stamps and everything. But the small businesses will go, on, like you say, go under. The hours are going to be cut. You know, there's, like I said, once again, I read studies that, you know, the minimum wage helps. And then I read other studies that say minimum wage actually hurts the people that it's designed to help. You know, like I say, you know, you, you're looking at both sides and it's hard to come up with an intelligent thing. And, you know, one of the things I would like to do is, like I said, we need to bolster our small businesses and cottage industries. You know, we get some businesses going and, you know, it'll produce better jobs, better businesses. And, you know, the wages will be accordingly. You know, like I said, I would like to see Hawaii jump in the hemp production you know, just for agriculture and, and manufacturing, you know, there's some good jobs if we can start manufacturing hemp products and, you know, hempcrete and all that other stuff, you know, building these businesses where we've got a demand for college degrees that pay good jobs and, and good jobs in the factories and work in these businesses. And the longest would be uh, made in Hawaii logo for exports. And, you know, it's just the trickle effect, ripple effect. You know, we need to instead of killing all these businesses, we need to be fostering businesses and bringing business in that's gonna bring in the good jobs and the higher pay and stuff like that. You know, it's supply and demand. If there's not good workers, people are gonna start paying premium dollars for the workers. I know that was at the work in, in the nuclear field. We ran out of quality people and wages started shooting up. You know, supply and demand, it's a, it's a basic thing, you know. And the small businesses, you know, it's, it's hard to keep a business. I, my brother-in-law and my sister lost their restaurant because of COVID. You know, they're just, it's horrible. You know, it's just the prices. And like you say, it's just, you know, they, ah, forgive me. It's <laughs> okay. Just uh, uh, there. We're just about, <laughs> thank you for that. We're just about out of time. Uh, thank you, Brian Lay, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, you sitting with us and answering all these questions. Thank you, Antu, for uh, conducting the interview. Um, we're building something that the Hawaii political establishment's never seen, a slate of Ono leaders. Uh, your donations can help buoy the system. If you'd like more information or like to make a donation, please visit us at hulihai.com. That's H-U-L-I-H-I.com. Thanks again, and have a great evening. Thank you for having me. Thank you.